Here we go. Here we go. All right. Y'all ready to get started? Let's see. Where's my, where's my, how do I get to my, where to go? All right, there we go. Da, 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 da. Okay, in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today we're going to talk about, you know, last time we talked about the Old Testament, we talked about what happened between the Persians, then the Greeks, you know, with Alexander the Great, then we went and looked at the Maccabees, then we looked at how the Romans took over the, the area of Jerusalem uh, when Pompeii invaded, and then we see that now we're in the time where Christ enters into the world by his incarnation, where he, the eternal Son of God takes on our flesh and becomes a human being in and through Mary the Theotokos, and now we're in New Testament times. We only got Old Testament and New Testament. So we're in New Testament times, and so Jesus enters into the world as a human being in the area of Israel or, or you know, where the Jews live. You know, this is kind of north of Jerusalem where he is. But say the area of the Jews, so it has a Hebrew history, and on top of that, it's under Roman rule. And before that, the Romans were heavily influenced, the Jewish people, by Hellenistic or Greek thought. So there's a whole lot going on uh, at the time when Christ enters into the world in that area of, we will just call Israel proper, the Hebrew nation area. Now, what we're going to look at today is just simply kind of the New Testament and the history that unfolds within it. All right. These are the books of the New Testament. Who can tell me which books are the Gospels? Which books make up the Gospels? Anybody? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Thank you, PB, spoken like a well-educated priest kid, all right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the gospel books. So these are the books that sit in a big book on the altar, right, of the church. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they, re they record the words of Christ and the teachings of Christ. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospels. They kind of tell the story of Jesus Christ from certain angles, because they're, they're, they're written to certain people groups, and they're trying to present Jesus in such a way to convince the, the people that are reading and, and uh, engaging the story about who Jesus was. The Gospel of John is a theological gospel. It's written about anywhere from 20 to 30 years later, but it's the, it's the gospel that's symbolized by the eagle of St. John, right? It soars to the heights of the heavens. It's the theological gospel. It reveals things to us kind of in a deeper, more mystical way than Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. Okay, let's see uh, who wrote Romans through Hebrews. Who wrote that section of the New Testament? The longest section of the New Testament. There's 27 books in the New Testament, and this one person wrote most of the epistles from Romans to Hebrews. Who was that? St. Paul. Okay. St. Paul wrote most of the books of the New Testament, and they're organized outside of this, usually according to length, from longest to the shortest. But we know that St. Paul wrote Hebrews, but whoever assembled this chart isn't really sure about that, but St. Paul wrote Hebrews. We believe that. Now, 
we see that James, the brother of our Lord, wrote an epistle. St. Peter wrote a couple of epistles. Then St. John wrote three epistles. There's one, Jude, and then Revelation. So out of all these books, which one tells us a story or, or, or reveals to us, and that's a good way to put it, reveals to us end times, like apocalyptic literature, what's going to happen at the end of the world and all that type stuff, and, then, and what happens to the church. Go ahead. What you got? Revelation. Revelation. That's right. The last book of the Bible. Now, it's written by St. John on the Isle of Patmos, probably around 90 AD. And we're going to look at when the dates of these books are later. But most all the New Testament books are written in the 50s and the 60s, 50, 60 AD. So 25 to 30 years after the ascension of Jesus Christ, our Lord, right? They're telling the story up until that point in time. It's oral tradition. So they're going around and saying, hey, let me tell you what happened. And let me tell you what took place with a man named Jesus Christ who came from heaven and revealed to us the kingdom of God. And this is what he taught and this is what he did. But eventually those stories and what took place began to be written down in the Gospels. And then St. Paul begins to write letters. Cut out. Can you hear me? Okay, hang on a minute. Let me unfreeze myself. Y'all tell me when I'm unfrozen. Am I back? Okay, we're back. With a brand new edition? Brand new edition. Father Jason 2.0. Okay. So as I was saying, most of the books are written in the 50s and the 60s. And many of them, like over here, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, etc., are written to churches that are already functioning like a church. They're meeting, they're worshiping, they're participating in Holy Communion. And these, most of these are churches that St. Paul founded on his missionary journeys, which we'll talk about in just a second. Now, does anybody know which, which of these books are called the pastoral epistles? Anybody? Okay. First and second Timothy and Titus. Those are called St. Paul's pastoral epistles. He writes to these young pastors and he instructs them in how to govern the church. Now, what about the prison epistles? Those that were drafted or written by St. Paul when he was in prison. Does anybody know what those are? I'll give you a hint. I'll tell you. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Those are called the prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Those are ones written by St. Paul in prison, okay? Now, looking at this, which one of these books tells us about the first 30 years of the history of the church? Which book is it? Acts. Acts, that's right. Acts of the Apostles. It's the, it's the second book in a two-volume series written by who? This is like part two of his work. Y'all remember? Okay. St. Luke wrote his gospel to, to the most excellent Theophilus. And then he writes the book of Acts to Theophilus. So Luke and Acts go together. You know, Luke is the, he, he says, listen, Theophilus, or he calls him most excellent in the beginning, 
I've taken the time to write down everything in order for you. So if you want to read one of the Gospels that's written in order, like historical, chronological order, like how things actually unfolded, then you would read the Gospel of Luke, and then you would turn around and read the Acts of the Apostles. It's going to cover the Gospel period of Jesus Christ, his birth, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, but then he's going to continue in the book of Acts and talk about what happened over the next 30 years. So Luke, Acts go together. All right, so that's the 27 books of the New Testament and how they're kind of broken up. James through Jude are called the general epistles. Romans, in this case through Hebrews, are called uh, the Pauline epistles. The book of Revelation is called apocalyptic literature. That's the genre that it's called, being the kind of style that it is. Acts is history. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke being synoptic Gospels, a synopsis of the life of Christ. And then St. John's Gospel being the theological Gospel. So that's the books that we have in the New Testament, the 27, and how they're broken up. Okay. All right, we went through these questions. Now, we're going to go back a little bit and let's see if we can remember who's who. All right, let's see. I'm going to pick who is this apostle? These are the 12. Who is this one? Y'all remember? I'm hoping it's blurry enough so you can't really read the name. St. Andrew? Yeah, yeah. St. Andrew's easy to remember because his hair is a little wilder, like mine when it's down. Okay. Let's see. Who is this, this saint, this apostle? St. Peter. St. Peter, that's right. Okay, let's try... This one's a little bit harder. Do y'all remember the youngest looking one? Thomas. The Apostle Thomas. Very good. How about, uh, whoops. How about, let's see. Huh. Let me pick another good one. One that maybe, let's see. How about this Apostle? He's a little harder. Simon. Okay. And let's do this one. Y'all remember who he is? We used to be able to go through these with our pictures or our icons. You could tell us who they were. Do y'all remember who this one is? James. Bartholomew. Bartholomew. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And let's see, let's pick one more. Um, trying to see if I can throw you all off of one of them. Uh, da, 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 da. How about, I'm trying to remember which ones we haven't gone over. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, this one, who is this? <laughs> There's a hint because he's holding a book, right? Matthew. Hey, Matthew. Correct. All right. Well done. Well done. So here are 12 apostles. We know that all of them uh, carry out missionary journeys, and they go to different places. Now, who is this? Sometimes we forget about them as being missionaries. Do you yeah. want us to pick each individual out? I want you to tell me who all these people know. I'm just saying, who is this group? They're called the... 70 Apostles. The 70 Apostles, that's right. When Jesus sends them out in Luke chapter 10. So sometimes we think about the 12 apostles, right? And going out and doing missionary work. 
But quite often we forget that, you know, there were 70 plus two that Christ sent out in Luke chapter 10 to go and carry the gospel message or his teachings into the world at that time during the, during the New Testament period when the, during the time of Christ. Um, one of these, I have a special uh, affection towards because it's uh, St. Yasinos or Jason. So I'm named after one of the 70 apostles that is uh, recorded in the book of Acts. By a matter of fact, when I was on Mount Athos, I met a man that was from the St. Yasinos' village. I thought that was kind of neat. All right. Who is this? I'll give you a hint. He was the Bishop of Jerusalem. St. James. St. James. Who else was he? Who was his brother? Well, half brother. Y'all remember? Adelphi. Jesus? Yes. You see right Adelphios Theos, the brother of the Lord. See? In the Greek. So we see that He's a major character in the, in the New Testament as well, right? So you've got the 12 apostles. You've got St. James, the brother of the Lord, who's a bishop of Jerusalem. Uh, then let's see. Who is the last apostle living on this earth? He probably reposed around 100 AD. And this icon gives you a hint because he was given the care of a very, very special woman. John. St. John, right? I love this icon. So this is St. John. He's the only one of the apostles that was not martyred. And he was given uh, the care of the Theotokos. So he took care of her, but he was also the one that was exiled on the Isle of Patmos and uh, wrote the epistles, but also the book of uh, Revelation. Now, where does this Bible verse come from? Can y'all see it? But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Where does that come from? Uh, Acts. It comes from the book of Acts, right? And again, the book of Acts was written by St. Luke, and our subject matter is church history, correct? So the book of Acts is telling us, once again, the 30 years of the history of the church, the first 30 years, but this is the outline that really the whole book of Acts unfolds according to this outline. And this is, these are the words of Christ before he ascends into heaven. And he's telling those that are gathered there that they're going to be his witnesses when the Holy Spirit has come upon them in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, in the book of Acts, who do we see mainly taking the gospel to the Jews? It really focuses on this one person. Who is it? The gospel to the Jews. Peter. St. Peter, correct. All right. Then who took the gospel to the Gentiles? That's right. I hear them in there saying St. Paul, correct. So in the book of Acts, we have two main people that we see really focused on in the book of Acts. St. Peter, St. Paul. There are others as well, but these two get the most attention because of who they were and the work that they did uh, for the spreading of the gospel. This is an icon, and quite often we see, you know, Saints Peter and Paul. So when do we normally really focus on them during the liturgical year? And there may be a day given over to commemorating them. When does that usually take place? I 
I'll give you a hint. Okay. Usually during summer camp at All Saints, at least the first four years, the only time we could schedule camp was during this certain uh, fasting season. The Apostles That's fast. right. The Apostles fast. That makes it really hard at camp when you're eating bagels and peanut butter all the time, right? So, you know, the Apostles fast is in June. The feast day of the Apostles, you know, the St. Peter and Paul fast or the Apostles fast is June 29th, right? And some days that or some years that fasting period is longer than others, depending on Pascha. But St. Peter and Paul are called like the pillars of the church among the apostles. Now, if we look at how things unfolded based on Acts 1.8, we see that in the first century, and let's get our bearings here because this is an old map. Over here, you can barely see the United Kingdom. That'd be like Southern England, then Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. They're over here, okay? Then this area, ancient Gaul, was also known as what we call today France, right? And you have Belgium in this area. Then down here, Hispania, Spain. Then you have North Africa. Then over here is Rome. Then you have Greece. Then you come around, here's Egypt. Here's Memphis, Tennessee, where Elvis used to live. And then, did y'all catch that? Different Memphis, right? No Elvis here. <laughs> Keep going around. And then we have, you know, this is the Mediterranean area. Here's Jerusalem. Here's Damascus, where uh, the headquarters of the Antiochian church still is to this day in this area. Duro Europus. I'm going to show, show you something really, really cool. Well, I think it's cool, but I'm a geek. Duro Europus is where they found one of the earliest house churches ever. In the third century, it dates back to about 230 AD. And Really was really neat. It, who ever it, has ever heard of Yale University? Yale, you know, it's the Ivy League school in, in Connecticut. Uh, they actually recreated the house church kind of in their library at Yale with all the iconography and everything in it. But we'll look at it when we get into the third century. We'll come back to Duro Europus and look at the house church that was discovered there. Of course, here's Antioch where they were first called Christians. We make our way around. You know, here's the Isle of Crete. We'll see we'll see St. Paul going there. Saint, you know, here's Cyprus. Of course, his Orthodox church is still scattered all over these places, right? Alexandria, where the great library was that burnt down. Let's make our way over here. Here we see the old city known as Byzantium, which became the Byzantine Empire headquarters, right? Constantinople. Then we'll make our way around. Here's Philippi, where the Philippians were. Thessaloniki. This is Mount Athos right here. And then, um, let's see, Corinth. We hear about it in the Bible. Then again, back up to the area of Rome. So in the first century, following the outline that Christ gave the apostles and others, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Judea would have been about this area right above it. Then Samaria. Then the uttermost parts of the earth. So in other words, Christ was saying, the same people that you denied me to, the Jews, you're going to go back to them now with power and tell them I was the Messiah, I am the Messiah. Then you're going to go out a little bit further in Judea. Then you even go to Samaria, to the people that you can't stand, the Samaritans. 
because y'all remember that we talked about the Assyrians and the Babylonians and how they came in and conquered Jerusalem. Well, the Assyrians would make people interbreed with each other. So the Jews became, the Samaritan Jews were like known as half breeds. They weren't full Jews. So they had their own mouth, their own temple, their own way of worship. And the Jewish people really did not like them. As a matter of fact, instead of walking through Samaria to get to Galilee, the northern region around this area, instead of walking straight through it from you know, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, say to Galilee, they would actually walk around it because they didn't want to go through Samaria. So our Lord is telling them, you're going to have power within you, the Holy Spirit working within you, that type of power to go tell people that you don't even like about me. So, you know, they may not look like you. They may not talk like you. They may be a lot different in many ways. But our responsibility, just like it was back then, is to take the gospel to all people. So by the end of the first century, mainly because of, well, St. Paul and the other apostles, but St. Paul is taking, you know, these three major missionary journeys where he's traveling everywhere. By the end of the first century, this is how far Christianity had reached in the Mediterranean and Black Sea region. Then by the second century, it gone almost all the way over to the United Kingdom. And some people say it actually made it to the United Kingdom in the second century. So that's a lot of, a lot of travel, a lot of people sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, if we look at the division of uh, the book of Acts, we can see that in chapters 1 through 12, Jerusalem is a center focus. St. Peter is a chief figure, and the message gets out as far as Samaria. The word is rejected by the Jews. Peter's imprisoned. We see the judgment on Herod. Also in the first, uh, first part of the book of Acts, the focus is on St. Peter. We see his first sermon in chapter 2. He heals a lame man in chapter 3. He encounters Simon the sorcerer in chapter 8. You know, his shadow brings healing to somebody in chapter 5. We see the laying on of hands in chapter 8. They mistakenly worship Peter in chapter 10. Then Dorcas or Tabitha is raised to life in chapter 9. Then Peter is imprisoned in chapter 12. So again, first half really is about Jerusalem, St. Peter. The second half of the book, chapters 13 through 28, Antioch is the center. St. Paul is a chief figure. And the message gets out all the way to the capital of the Roman Empire, Rome itself. And St. Paul first goes and takes the gospel message to Jews in what is known as the diaspora. You know, we often hear that term in the Orthodox Church. That's where the Jewish people were taken and scattered all around the world by the Assyrians and others. And they would gather together in little groups. And over time, remember, they formed these synagogues where the Jews in that area would come together and they would read the Old Testament scriptures, the Torah, the law, the prophets, the poetical books. They would read them together. And when St. Paul would go to these different countries, he would always go and find the Jews that were meeting in synagogue, and he would tell them about who Christ was. And quite often, they didn't receive the message. We see Paul imprisoned, then judgment on the Jews. Everything now starts turning towards the Gentiles, those that are non-Jews. In chapter 13, he preaches his first sermon. A lame man is healed. He encounters a sorcerer. The influence of a handkerchief brought healing. And look at the parallels between what's going on with St. Peter and what's going on with St. Paul. They kind of look a lot alike, don't they? Laying on hands in chapter 9, they worship Paul in chapter 14. He says, no, 
If that's not what this is about. And Eutychus is raised to life in chapter 20. Paul's in prison and the message keeps going in Acts chapter 28. So it's really neat to study and see how St. Peter's life in Jerusalem and in that area kind of is mirrored by St. Paul's life as he carries the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay, y'all with me? Thumbs up? All right. Now this, of course, is an icon of St. Paul. Now over a period of 10 years in the middle of the first century, St. Paul made three major missionary journeys traveling throughout the Mediterranean region spreading the gospel. So three major missionary journeys. There's another one, the fourth, but that's really him going to Rome uh, where he will unfortunately uh, become a martyr for the sake of Christ along with St. Peter as well. Now, during this time, travel wasn't easy. Uh, the more, majority of the journeys were made on little boats and they would travel around the Mediterranean facing storms, bad seas. So to go and take the gospel message really meant to take your life into your own hands. Now this is Paul's first and second journeys. Now somebody tell me one place that Paul went on his first missionary journey by looking at the map. Go ahead, Samuel. Antioch. Yep, he leaves from Antioch. That's like his home base, correct? He's in Antioch. So where? give me somewhere else he goes on the first missionary journey. Lystra. What's Lystra? that? Yeah. Lystra. Lycia? Yeah, it's kind of hard to read, Samuel, but yeah. Oh, Lystra, yeah. He went there a couple times. Yeah, I thought you were talking about Lycia. Yeah? Where else? Jerusalem. Well, that's the second one. See the green? So we're having to follow the first missionary journey, which is in purple. He went somewhere I'd really like to go. Two different places in Cyprus. Right here. So his first missionary journey doesn't take him near as far as a second and the third, but it's in this area. Now the second missionary journey, somebody tell me where else he went on his second missionary journey. We know he went to Jerusalem. Where else did he go? Athens. Yes, Athens, that's right. Where else? Now, Athens is in what country? Greece. Athens is in Greece, correct. Greece. He also went to Corinth on his second. He went to Corinth, correct. And what country is Corinth in? Greece as well. Greece as well. Okay, wonderful. All right. So we see he makes his way up around Berea, Thessaloniki, Apollonia, Neapolis, Philippi. He comes back through Troas, you know, Asia Minor area, and he makes his way back ultimately to the area around Antioch. So St. Paul's busy, correct? Now, it was common, like I said, when St. Paul would go into an area that he would meet where the Jews met in synagogue. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy traveled to Thessaloniki where there is a synagogue. Paul visits and preaches there for three consecutive Sabbaths. What does that mean? Three consecutive Sabbaths. What's the Sabbath day? What day of the week is a Sabbath day? According to Sunday? The, according to the Jews. Saturday. Saturday, that's right. Because Sunday was the first day of the week. We call that the new Sabbath, right? Um, that The first day of the week, the day of the resurrection, 
uh, the day of the new kingdom, the day of the new creation when Christ rose again. But the Sabbath, and we still see the Saturday as a Sabbath as well, but that was the holy day for the Jewish people, and they would rest on that day and gather in synagogue. Now, he goes there and he begins to preach to the Jews that Jesus is a Savior of mankind that was spoken of in the Old Testament, because why? There's no New Testament books right now. There's no Gospels. Uh, there's no early church writings. It's just people going and telling what has happened to them, like St. Paul, who was converted on the road to Damascus. Y'all remember that story, right? Where Christ appears to him, he goes blind, and he was going around persecuting Christians, and now he is saying, no, Christ is a Messiah. Now I truly understand the Old Testament, and he's going and using the Old Testament scriptures to try to convince the Jews that Jesus was a Messiah, the one they had been waiting for, the Savior. Now, this is the church of, of the Vladaton Monastery. It's in Thessaloniki. I've actually been there. And that area right here is where, historically, according to tradition, St. Paul preached the gospel to those in Thessaloniki, the Thessalonians. And so there's a monastery built there. And so that, that's been a, a place of reverence and a pace, place of pilgrimage for an extremely long time. Now, when you look at this, when you look at the picture, you notice anything that seems kind of odd. Look on the walls. What do you think? Like it looks like it's been like burned. Looks like what? It looks like it's been like burned. It looks like it's been burned, okay. What else? There are paintings. Yeah, there's icons. But what what are these little things here? You see these little things everywhere? What do you think that is? Any idea? Places where paint is chipped. It looks like places where paint is chipped. Okay. That's not it, though. Get is it mold? It's not mold. Is it stars? Not stars. It looks like a bomb or something. You're getting closer. There was an explosion? No, I'll no. tell you. When the Turks invaded, the Muslims, they can't stand iconography, right? So they went around the whole monastery with a pickaxe, hitting and striking all the iconography, any place there was an image. So this is a remnant of that where the Muslims hit all the iconography with like a pickaxe. So... I remember walking through the monastery. Of course, I didn't ever think it would be anything like this. I'm naive, you know. And I'm like, well, this is a strange way to decorate the inside of a building, you know. I've never seen iconography uh, done like this or a building with this type of texture. And uh, one of the monks said, that's not what it is. And he could speak English, and he told me about it. So it still looks like that today. Now, Paul, uh, St. Paul also goes to Athens. We're just taking a couple of places simply because of time, right? But Paul speaks uh, to a meeting of the Areopagus where he uses the existence of an altar dedicated to the unknown God to reveal the existence of a creator God who alone is worthy of worship. So we know there was a lot of philosophers there. There was a lot of uh, altars built to... Uh, deities and gods and i'm sure y'all studied uh these various gods in history before the roman gods the greek gods um which ultimately we would say were probably fallen angels that were being worshipped by uh the people of the mediterranean and but they have one to the unknown god 
that whoever that is, the unknown one. And so St. Paul comes in Acts chapter 16, 17, and uses that reference to the unknown God to say, listen, let me reveal to you the God of gods, the King of glory, who is the true God. And go ahead. My family and I actually climbed the Areopagus. Yeah, I knew y'all had been there. What a it neat was pretty place. What a neat place to go and see, right? And to think that St. Paul was there and all this was taking place. It's really neat when you walk in those places knowing that the apostles were there, um, that all the history that has taken place. But right when St. Paul started talking about the resurrection, he lost all of them, or most of them. But some still listened and believed. Now, here's Paul's third missionary journey. And really somewhat the fourth, but it's a little bit different because he's going to Rome. But look at the third missionary journey. Tell me where St. Paul goes on his third missionary journey. Give me a few places. Athens. Athens, Corinth, he's there again. This time he makes his way to Ephesus. He goes through Rhodes. Tarsus. So he kind of covers a lot of the same area, right, in his third missionary journey. Now on the fourth, let's see. Hang on one second. I'll be right back. Sorry, everybody's doing different schoolwork. The, the college girls are doing their things too. So we see that St. Paul in the fourth missionary journey, he's really being taken to Rome where he wanted to go anyway, just not in custody. All right. Now, Paul is taken before the Sanhedrin, the governing body. The Romans take Paul away and decide to scourge him to find out what crimes he has committed. But Paul is saved from being scourged when he declares that he is a Roman citizen. Now, this is extremely important to be a Roman citizen during this time, okay? This, this gives you a little idea what it meant to be a Roman citizen. Not everybody had these rights. The right to vote, to hold office, to make contracts, to own property, lawful marriage. But let's go down here a little bit. The right to defend oneself in court. The right to have a legal trial with a judge. The right to appeal a decision. No Roman citizen could be tortured, whipped, or receive the death penalty unless found guilty of treason. So when they were wanting to beat St. Paul, he says, listen, can't touch me. I'm a Roman citizen. And you've got to prove treason before you can do anything to me that's harmful in this way. So by appealing as a Roman citizen, it gave him a court appearance. Now, the Lord appears to Paul and tells him that he must testify about him in Rome. So we know that Paul is going to end up going to Rome because the Lord is directing him that way. Paul is escorted out of the city at night by Roman soldiers so that he won't be killed. The soldiers take Paul to Caesarea, to the Roman governor of Judea, so that he can decide Paul's fate. Paul is a Roman prisoner for two years, in which time he defends himself three times. Paul requests to be tried by Rome rather than risk returning to Jerusalem, because if he goes back to Jerusalem, the Jews, uh, they're after him in Jerusalem. They don't want him there. 
In late AD 60, Paul and other prisoners board a ship for Rome escorted by a Roman centurion named Julius. They go to the Isle of Crete. Paul warns him, don't go any further because a storm is coming. But his words of warning are disregarded and they sail for Crete. And they end up being shipwrecked on Malta. They grab boards and make their way to the island. They're there for three months. Many of them get sick and Paul works miracles. They leave for Rome, stopping in the port of Piatoli, where Paul stays for one week with Christians in the area before traveling to Rome. Then the centurion Julius delivers Paul to the captain of the guard in Rome. Paul is allowed to live by himself, guarded only by a soldier. For two years, Paul is able to receive visitors and continue his preaching of the gospel. Now, I always love this. If you go to the book of Philippians, you know, this is one of the prison epistles, right? Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. If you look at the prison epistle of Philemon, or Philippians, uh, Paul is in jail and he's writing to them. He's under house arrest. So you can imagine all day long, there's a guard assigned to him, a, a Roman guard. So all day long, that Roman guard has to listen to St. Paul talk about Christ and sing hymns about the Lord. And I imagine the very beginning is irritating him to no end. Say, this this hey. character is talking about his God again. But then all of a sudden, St. Paul starts getting his attention. And if you read in the book of Philippians, when Paul is concluding the letter, he said, even those of Caesar's household send their greetings. So while Paul's in prison, converting all these Roman soldiers, the gospel has made its way all the way up into Caesar's household, in and through Paul's imprisonment and his sharing of the gospel. Okay? Now, Paul is released from prison in AD 63 and goes back to the Isle of Crete. From there, he goes to Nicopolis in Macedonia. Here he is again. Paul, once again, is a prisoner in Rome, writes a letter to his friend Timothy, young Timothy, St. Timothy. It is Paul's last writing before he dies a martyr's death around the middle of AD 68. So, Paul was beheaded in Rome on what was called the Austerian Way, and uh, St. Peter was martyred in Rome as well. So Rome and the early church had a special place of significance because it's a capital of the Roman Empire, right? So the Sea of Rome is a very highly respected sea. It becomes more important than Jerusalem early in church history but one of the main reasons why it was so important to Christians wasn't just because it was a capital of the Roman Empire, it's where many of the martyrs died. So Rome was full of the blood of the martyrs, especially St. Peter and St. Paul, the pillars of the church. So when we talk about Rome and we talk about its importance, it's important politically, it's important militarily, it's important socially and historically, but for the church, it's mainly important because the blood of the martyrs that were shed there in the Colosseum, you know, outside of Rome, thousands of Christians crucified on the Austerian way leading to it. So it has that type of history to us as well. Now, just as somewhat of a conclusion, because we're about out of time, I got one minute. Listen to all that St. Paul went through for the sake of the gospel. And labor is more abundant and stripes above measure and prisons more frequently and deaths often. For the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. What does that mean? 40 stripes minus one is how many? Was 40 minus one. What's 40 minus 1? 39. 39. The reason why he says that, because it was known if you received 40 stripes, it would kill you. Okay? 
Three times I was beat with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I had been in the deep, and journeys often in perils of water, and perils of robbers, and perils of my own countrymen, and perils of the Gentiles, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, and weariness and toil, and sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, and fastings often in cold and nakedness, besides the other things what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. So, St. Paul persecuting the church, persecuting Christians, encounters Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies, the Messiah that was promised, the risen Lord. And that encounter turned his life upside down. And his love for Christ was so deep and so beautiful that he went through all these things just so you and I could hear the gospel. And the other apostles suffered as well. But look at all he went through just to make sure that the gospel message of Jesus Christ our Lord was shared. All his travels, all his hardships. All. Now, now, we have hymnography for St. Peter as well. We'll talk about that uh, next time. But I was really focusing on Paul to get us to the end of the books of Acts, which is the history of the church, right? First 30 years. First and throne of the apostles, teach the universe, and treat the man of all, to grant peace to the world, and to save our souls. Great mercy. Okay? So anyway, I won't go through all of them, but you can read through the hymnography of St. Paul and St. Peter. All right. That gets us to where we need to end for today. And I'm trying to get back to Moss. There we go. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Who was the Caesar during um, Peter and Paul's imprisonment and their um, martyrdom? That's a good question. I wanted to say it was, um, I actually had that. Was it Nero? Nero is end of the first century. I think his reign started before that. It'll be close. It's after Caesar Augustus in between Nero. Uh, it's the, um, maybe Tiberius. I'll go back and check, Cheryl. I've got in the list of the Caesars. I can't remember the order they go in, but uh, it was on the last slide, uh, last time, last gathering. But what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put a little study guide together for everybody kind of going over some of the major points that we've covered from the period of the Old Testament, the uh, period between the major prophets of Malachi and St. John the Baptist, sometimes known as the intertestamental period by others, uh, and then go over the New Testament, uh, kind of what we talked about today. I'm going to send a study guide out for you, and then next week we'll have a little quiz and you'll have your notes, but I'll quiz you and we'll try to answer those questions together before we get into the apostolic fathers, those that come right after the apostles. All right. Good job, y'all. The Lord bless and keep you. And God willing, we'll see you soon. Take care. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.